Okay, welcome. Uh, so it's it's a pleasure to introduce our very own Professor Jonathan Ellis as today's colloquium speaker. Uh, he's an associate professor here in optical sciences, and he started off uh, at the University of North Carolina Charlotte at their Center for Precision Metrology. He got his bachelor's and his master's degree there, and then he moved on and got his PhD at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. And after that, uh, he went to the University of Rochester, where he was a professor, um, starting in uh, July 2011. Uh, but last year, in September 2017, he came uh, and joined us here at the College of Optical Sciences. Um, there's a lot, a lot of interest, um, the interaction of uh, engineering and mechanical, optical, and electrical fields. Uh, but he also um, co-founded and started a company called Clario Vision. I think we'll hear more about that today, which seeks to transform laser refractive surgery. Uh, and so today we're going to hear about intra-tissue refractive index shaping. So thanks, John. Thanks for the inter introduction. Um, so as Jason said, my name's John Ellis. I'm an associate professor here. Um, this is my first time giving a colloquy here. So I've, I've given a talk here before for you know the interview purposes and all that. But um, as far as talking to a predominantly um, student-based audience, this is really my first time doing that. So. I'm going to give you an overview of two parts, or this presentation is going to have two parts. One of them is just going to be overview of my research group, um, and then the second part we're going to get into sort of meat and potatoes of the, the uh, colloquia today. So I run a group that I call the Precision Instrumentation Group. Um, basically, we build tools and instruments to enable scientific investigations. So for example, we work on everything from the sort of optical design. So this is a beautiful low coherence scanning interferometer that's um, for measuring not only the thickness of uh, optical or thickness of materials but also the optical surfaces this was specifically for characterizing grin lenses um, we do some custom mechanics and alignment and everything else um, we take benchtop systems oh i can't see the mouse cursor here we take benchtop systems we do some solid modeling and then we eventually make you know a small probe in this case um, and then we also do a lot of the signal processing and analysis. So stuff that might be done offline, and you sit there and chug through in MATLAB, that's all fine and dandy, but we're taking data at really high speeds and you need to feed it into, say, machine tools at really high speeds. You can't do that stuff offline. You need to do it all online, and then eventually you may need to do some fancy signal processing to correct for errors. So we do a lot of that stuff too. We also like to have a lot of fun. So the Precision Instrumentation Group is um, PIG, you know, the first letters of each of them. Uh, it's a transplant from the University of Rochester, so I've kept the name. Um, as Jason said earlier, I started last year, about a year ago. Ah, fantastic. I'm tall, but not that tall. All right. Um, so I'm trained as a MECI. Um, but I'm interested in optical instrumentation, precision engineering, and metrology systems. Um, as I said, you know, the, the group, the PIG, so my graduate students are affectionately known as piglets. There's a whole row of them sitting in the audience here, so that's kind of fun. I've graduated 15 students in a range of disciplines from MECI to optics and electrical and computer engineering. It's been eight PhD students, seven master's students to date. And we, I'm currently at about 10 people or so. There's still some holdover at the U of R. Actually, I have one student who's working at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, and then I'm slowly building up the group here, and I'm still looking for more people, especially in the topic that I'm presenting today. We mostly do applied research. Um, just to forewarn you, a lot of my students as part of training are likely going to end up in industry. I have yet to have a student who wanted to go into academia after being in my group. So if you're hell-bent on being a professor, you, I, I'm glad to mentor you. But typically, I'm training students either for a national lab or for industry. Um, I also like to spin off technology. So I try to work on things that are practical and have a potential commercial aspect. So example, we co-founded Clario in 2014. This was a spin-off from the U of R. It's now grown to raising about $20 million of investment money, and it's probably 25 or so um, full-time employees. Um, so we go the route of patents, and then we try to spin off or license, and then we focus on the things like publishing. We're not trying to chase things in science and nature. Um, so those are likely not found in my, in, in my group. 
Um, and we work with a lot of companies, large and small, as well as startup and a range of government sponsors. So at the University of Arizona, there are four main areas that I'm going to be working on. Laser processing of materials, this is both soft materials, so hydrogels, meaning contact lenses and intraocular lenses, that's the top, uh, today's talk topic. And then hard materials like glasses and ceramics, so how can we do laser processing with those? I have um, a fairly sizable collaboration um, on photoacoustic cancer detection. There's elements that are here. There are also elements of that that are back in Rochester. Um, here we're focusing on skin cancer. In, uh, in Rochester we're focus focusing on nodules and larger, deeper tumors in the body. Um, I want to work more on space and defense instrument instrumentation. This was one of the key factors for me coming here. Um, there are limited opportunities to be able to do that in Rochester. And then lastly, freeform optics metrology is another area where I have a fairly sizable collaboration. All right, so today's topic is manufacturing of gradient index lenses for ophthalmic applica applications. And I'm going to sort of talk you through, you'll see these pictures as I go through this talk. Now, um, one of the things that I've learned with working with anything that's related to the biospace, you have to put your disclosures up front. So I'm a scientific co-founder and equity holder in Clario Vision, which partially supports this research. Um, they support research activities at the University of Arizona, and I technically have an appointment at the University of Rochester, and they also support those. I have a conflict of interest management plan in place at both institutions. It says that I must say this at the start of every single technical talk. Um, patents held by the University of Rochester um, are licensed. Oh, patents held by the University of Rochester and licensed to Clario Vision. That means that the University of Rochester has an institutional conflict of management plan in place. It also says that I must say this at the start of every single talk. Okay. In, truth be told, when you're working in the biospace, one, because there's so much money involved, and two, you're talking about um, patient safety and health outcomes, having that up front is actually a breath of fresh air rather than someone just breezing through it at the end of a talk when, frankly, half the audience has stopped listening by that point, right? All right, so let's get into it. I'm going to start with some basics. So we're going to crawl, and then we're going to walk, and then we're going to run really quickly, all right? So the optical power of an interface, all right, so everybody has seen a schematic like this. You have some curved surface here, and there's a refractive index change, and we can define the optical power of that interface because we have some curved surface and we have some refractive index change. So fundamentally, optical power can be induced by both the uniform refractive index difference and the surface curvature, all right? So we highlight that there. So that allows us to do things like focus light. All right, so we can have a lens here, we can take a collimated beam, and if we do everything correctly with our shapes, we can get a nice little point there, okay? So uh, this is the case where light is gonna transmit through a refractive surface with uniform refractive index difference, right? So this is some glass material where light's going through. However, um, if we don't have any curvature at that surface, we don't generate any optical power, right? So our refractive index is constant, there's no curvature, so there's no optical power. If we put a gradient index, or we somehow spatially vary our refractive index in our material, and so now our refractive index is changing, okay? We can have a situation where we have nice plane parallel sides, and no curvature, but with a spatially varying index um, or gradient index, and this will induce optical power. So how many of you know what this is called? Grin, but what type of grin? No. No? <laughs> I saw one hand, Martin. It, it is a radial grin. It's commonly called a wood lens. All right, so this gives us four options where we can fundamentally alter the characteristics of where our light is going in our system. So we can vary the surface shape and just the surface shape and have a constant refractive index. We can have flat surfaces which wouldn't normally induce any optical power, but we can spatially vary the refractive index, have a gradient index, and we can induce optical power. All right, 
The other thing that we can do is we can have some shape change and induce a gradient index in our material and do some interesting things. This would be the case where if you wanted spherical surfaces, but you wanted to correct for spherical aberration in your system, because this is not necessarily a thin lens. All right? So if you have a gradient in the index like this, you will correct for spherical um, aberration. The thing that I want you to focus on for this talk is you can also think of it as you have some shape, and it may not be perfect, and you can go in there and you can add some gradient index and apply a correction so you do get the optical properties that you want. Right? So let's focus on this where we're going to think about this lens here as our optical system, and this gradient index is going to correct or improve the optical performance. And what we're going to be applying this to is the patient's cornea or a contact lens. That's our base substrate that we're working with. So we're either working with hydrogel, which is a plastic and really easy to work with, or we're working with cornea, which is a nightmare to work with, honestly. But you can do it. And our iris process, intra-tissue refractive index shaping, is what we're going to do to try to correct the inaccuracies in this. Can everybody follow along with that? I see some nods. They're mostly from my students. They should know this. All right. Let's take a step back and let's talk about the eye care market. All right. About 50% of adults require some form of vision correction. And once you get over about 40 to 45, that number turns to 100%. Because when you get to be about 40 or 45, what do you end up with? Cataracts. Not cataracts. <laughs> That's like 65. Although you can get them earlier. I mean... Exactly. Your lens can't accommodate. You get presbyopia. So we're going to talk about that later. All right. So about uh, greater than 2.5 billion people worldwide wear some form of glasses. All right. That's the most common. About 130 million people worldwide wear contact lenses. All right. Now, one of the things I want you to think about is uh, they typically wear contact lenses up until they get to about 40 or 45, and then when they can't accommodate anymore, they run out of headroom, and now they're wearing contact lenses and typically reading glasses. All right? You can get LASIK or laser refractive surgery, all right? and there's other variants, PRK and SMILE or other procedures. To give you a size scale, this is about 700,000 patients in the US, and it's decreasing year over year. All right? And there's an ick factor associated with it. We'll get into that. Right? And then lastly, there's about 20 million cataract patients worldwide where they go in, they make a small incision, they pop out your lens, they, they break it up into smaller chunks first because it's quite large, and then they stick a plastic one in there. Right? Is Jim Schweigerling in here? He is not. All right. If you want to know more about this, he's designed some IOLs, and actually he just had cataracts um, replaced, I want to say, like a month ago or so. And he actually has an interesting talk that he gives on sort of what his vision looked like prior to getting the cataract and what his vision looks like now, all right? There's one common theme to all of these, which is all of these alter the visual performance by changing the shape of the optical system, right? Every single one of these, LASIK changes the shape, this changes the shape, there's a contact lens which changes the shape of your cornea, and here we're going to put a lens in there which changes the shape, all right? Now, before I get into our process, I just want to give you some background on LASIK, because I said that there was a, a, a fairly large number of patients, you know, 700,000 or so, but the market share is decreasing. And the reason is it has a very high ick factor. I mean, the, the joke that we say is you can only screw up with your eyes twice, right? Once, once you've messed up one eye and then the other, there's no more eye to mess up, right? <laughs> you kind of laugh, but there's... You know, when you're talking about your eyes, there's about 500 microns, right? For a size scale, 500 microns is how many sheets of paper? Five sheets of paper, that's right. So the human cornea is anywhere between 400 and 600 microns, so there's four to six sheets of paper that's, you know, holding up the pressure in your eye. That's actually really thin, um, so you want to treat that very carefully, all right? We have photoablative techniques for vision correction, PRK and, and LASIK. And for the most part, they are safe procedures. 
If you go to some fly-by-night place in a strip mall somewhere, maybe not so much. But if you go to reputable places, their success rate is generally over 99%. Okay, and a lot of the people that we work with that are LASIK surgeons or PRK surgeons, they work in that regime where they're very careful about aligning the flap and everything else, and their number of side effects in there are reduced. But at the same time, when you talk about manually debriding the epithelium, so you're scraping off the epithelium in the eye, the front cover of the eye, and then you photoablate, you use a, a laser and you remove material, and then you put a soft bandage on there and let that heal over a few months, or you use a femtosecond laser and you put a bunch of holes there and you cut a flap, then you take some tweezers and you pull it back and then you use your eczema laser and then you fold the flap back over, there's a sort of ick factor about it. No one likes having their eyes cut. Um, so this is the current state of the art for laser refractive surgery and I wanna talk to you about what our process is and how it differs, right? Now, where we're going with this is sort of a scalable technology. We envision that this can be used in all three markets. So for example, we can have an iris contact lens. So this is a contact lens on the front of your eye and we do our process in the contact lens. One of the things that we're hoping to achieve is finer corrections than your 0.25 diopter and 10 degree astigmatic angular correction. We can also potentially correct for higher order aberrations like spherical aberration or trefoil. Uh, basically, if we can map your eye, we can tell you what correction you need and correct for all of it. If you're using a molding process as they currently do, that's very expensive. All right, and this addresses inventory um, and I said the contact lens molds. For intraocular lenses, um, there's some effects with just-in-time uh, manufacturing that has to do with the manufacturing chain and um, how the prescription is devised for each individual patient. But you can imagine that we're going to stick this contact or this, this intraocular lens in the eye and then it's going to take maybe a month or so or six weeks before it finally settles in the eye and the patient typically ends up with some misalignment post-implantation. And so post-implantation, then you have to go back in and either have laser refractive surgery on the front of the eye or wear glasses or wear contact lenses. So while it affects the, it, 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 it corrects the large problem that you have with cataracts, which is your lens becomes opaque, you still may have refractive error. And then the last one is iris in the cornea. And this is where we just go in with a laser and we tweak the cornea below the damage threshold of the material. And now um, we can affect some refractive index change in here to change the shape of how the light bends through here. The key is that we don't do any cutting or ablating. I'll show you some um, SEM and TEM pictures. Um, this gives us a larger addressable market share. So for example, folks like me, I can see just fine. I passed my driver's test without wearing glasses. This just helps me see a little bit better. All right, so I'm about minus 1.25 diopters. Because of the risks associated with LASIK, I'm not a good candidate for it. All right, the risk versus reward for me to get LASIK isn't worth it. For something like this, if we can make smaller refractive powers, then I am a candidate. This opens up a larger market. The other thing is there's people with thin corneas, maybe 300 microns or so, and there, if you have to remove material, um, you run the risk of getting ectasia or a bulge in the eye, and then your vision is very um, distorted, all right? And so people who have a, a cornea that, that is too thin cannot get LASIK because they will remove too much of the material, right? Um, the other thing is we'd like to test whether this is scalable over a patient's life because we only affect about a 10 micron layer of material in the eye that um, potentially you can get a correction, you know, when you're a teenager and then when you need a presbyopic correction when you're in your 40s, we can go back in there and we don't run into issues where um, you remove too much material and you can't remove any material anymore because we're not doing that process. All right, so how does it work? All right, so first I want to talk a little bit about laser material interactions. You have lin linear absorption, so this is single photon process. This is independent of intensity and it occurs throughout the beam. So if you have some rather thick material and this is an absorbing medium, this will absorb as it passes through, okay? It's not a function of intensity, it's just a function of the absorption and how much it's going through the material. 
If you have nonlinear absorption, when you have a low NA focus, you tend to get a hot spot here where you start getting more interactions. When you start focusing at a high NA, and it's a little subjective as to what you call high NA, some people say 0.2 NA, some people say 0.7 NA, some people say 1.4 NA, right? For us, high NA starts at around 0.3 or so. Um, this is a multi-photon process. It is a function of intensity, and it only occurs in the focal region. So here you can imagine that this is the front surface of your cornea, the epithelium. This is the back surface of your cornea, the endothelium. And we're only affecting this little spot here. All right? We don't do anything to the front or the back because it's a multi-photon process. Now, how do we generate multi-photon processes? We use tightly focused femtosecond pulses. That causes nonlinear absorption. The localized nonlinear absorption in the focal region causes changes in the refractive index. So we take our pulsed laser. It goes into our material. We focus it to a rather small spot. All right? And then we take that spot and we raster it around. We have some mechanical systems that cause our, or cause our focal spot to move around through the material. And by changing the intensity, as a function of position, we can build up refractive devices. Now, this is an incredibly complex process. Beam intensity, translation speed, the material properties, the NA, the wavelength, the pulse energy, the rep rate, da 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 da, da, da. There's about 13 different parameters that go into this that all matter. Um, and so you have to know a lot about your system. And we've spent the past, I started working on this project in 2012, so we're six years out. Um, we know most of the interaction, but we only know that interaction for one or two materials. And at the same time, we've tested, in some cases, hundreds of materials. And so categorizing all of them is a difficult task for all of these different things. Now, one of the key things I want to stress is that we operate below the damage threshold of the material. So if you think of laser power or just light power into the eye, Right? There's a certain amount of, of power that can go into your eye where you have no effect. Right? We have lights in this room that allow us to see. You can shine a laser pointer in your eye for a few seconds and it doesn't really hurt you. All right? Don't do that. All right? <laughs> you can go into the other regime, which is a photoablation regime, where the laser power gets very high. And then now you can exceed the damage, damage threshold of the cornea. This is the case with excimer lasers and LASIK and PRK. And this is the existing technology for photoablation. Right? In our case, we're working in this regime here where you can change the refractive index up to the point where you can cause damage. So for instance, if our laser power is high enough, we can you know, burn things in the lab if we're not careful, or if we hold it in position for too long. Right? So we do have to be careful about some of our scanning parameters. For existing flap cutters, the Zymer and the Intralace, they're working with pulse energies that are around 150 nanojoules to 1 microjoule, whereas we are orders of magnitude lower. We're about 2.5 nanojoules per pulse. Okay? So it's an entirely different regime. The way that I like to think about it is, you know, like a woodpecker is going to peck real slightly, on, you know, and eventually make that hole in a tree, whereas if you're trying to cut down that tree, you're going to use an ax and take some big swings at it, right? That's the difference in order of magnitudes between these. All right? And as I said, this writing curve is a function of many different parameters here. So it's not just this curve here. It's this n-dimensional space. All right. So I've talked about the process. Let's talk about what it does and show you some results. The first thing I'm going to show you is iris in inert tissue. Okay? Hydrogels are a tissue analog. We like them because we can buy commercial off-the-shelf contact lenses or have you know, hydrogels molded for a specific size and do all sorts of interesting things in them. And we don't run the risk of any of the biological contamination effects. We don't have to worry about tissue degradation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to give you a walkthrough of some of the systems that we've built up to be able to do this because while we're doing scientific investigations with this, a lot of what I focus on is how can we do it bigger, better, faster, stronger, OK? So we have existing systems in the lab. And generally, um, you know, they work. But if we can produce 10x more devices, that means we can understand our process better. To give you an idea, these are HERO experiments. This was one of the first systems. This is a stitched galvo. 
All right, this was done by Gustavo Gandara, who's a, a PhD student still at the University of Rochester. All right, and some, you know, it's 80 megahertz rep, rep rate, tie sapphire, and we go into uh, a Galvo that's relayed into an inverted microscope objective, and we have a camera to be able to view things. These are little phase bars. This is differential phase contrast. These are little phase bars here. So the bright that you see here is phase in the material. And we write these little bars, and we also actually write these little fiducials for aligning where our samples are for measuring them. And then we built a little mini mock Zender interferometer. And to do all of these little stitch structures, when we first started, literally took days. All right, so he would be in there for 12 hours and write part of a sample, and then come back the next day, rehydrate, write another part of a sample, and so on and so on and so on. Now, we would, then you have to take all these little bars, stick them in the mock zender, subtract out noise, look at this bar versus the background, and then this bar of the background, but clearly you can see that we're inducing some phase change in the material. So in this case, we're getting about 0.3 waves at 633 nanometers, which is what our mock zender wavelength is at. And this is in AccuView 2, which is a Johnson & Johnson material. It's based off of Adafilicon A, which is a commercial contact lens. There's probably three to five people in this room that are wearing that on their eye right now. All right, so we know that we can affect the phase of the material, all right? If you make enough of these bars, let's go back, if you make enough of these bars and analyze enough of them, you can generate what we call a, 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 a phase map, all right? So this is our phase in our material, this is the speed that we're writing with, and this is the power that we're sending in, all right? Now in this case, this is all running at 800 nanometers, okay? So this is, uh, it says 400, but this is, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's 400 or 800. Later on, we're, we're definitely at 400. I forget whether this is at 400 or 800. So there's a discrepancy between the, the figure and this, right? Um, our two biggest knobs that we have are speed and power, and then probably NA is the third biggest knob in terms of what we do then to the material. This is the trifoil structure that we try to write in the material, and this is what we actually measure when we write this in our little inverted Galvo system. Now, you can see that there's, we have a nice trifoil pattern, but there's this other speckle in the background, okay? Uh, this is actually native to the, the contact lens. Um, this is not indicative of our writing process. So we've, we've written a number of these types of things, and it shows up in all of them. We've measured um, control samples, and they have this sort of blanket sort of structure of the phase in the background, all right? And we published a paper on this that shows we can make, you know, arbitrary refractive devices with it. We can make trifoil, spherical, we can do it astigmatic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you spend a lot of time in the lab, and Gustavo is a very meticulous scientist, um, he can stitch together large area hydrogels. So these are Fresnel lenses. So these big circles here are the wraps of a Fresnel lens. And then these rectangles here are 88 microns by 245 microns stitched rectangles, and eventually they're covering a six millimeter area, which is starting to get to an appreciable size for a refractive zone for a patient, okay? And if you do that, and then you build a whole MTF bench that can tell you the, the optical power and the, um, the MTF performance of the lens, you can generate a number of different lenses here, and we can show that if we want to generate a minus three diopter lens, we, we're intending to write minus three diopters, we get minus three diopters, we want to write minus one and a half, we get minus one and a half, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And our higher order RMS error is very low here. It's basically within the noise, okay? So we can generate re very appreciable refractive powers, all right? So we're getting minus three diopters all the way up to plus 1.5. We have data that goes all the way from minus 10 to 10 um, diopters, which covers 99% of the human vision you know, spectrum that you're gonna get in terms of the correction that's needed. But this takes forever. Each one of these lenses is probably 17 hours of writing, and he has to be there the whole time that it's writing. So that's kind of unfortunate. So one of the other things that we were working on at the same time with another group of students was building what we call rockfish. And rockfish is this, inverted um, three-axis stage paired with a two-axis galvo that's over here that's relayed into a microscope objective. 
All right? And this is supposed to be dual duty, right? So we, we can stick a hydrogel on this little sample holder here, or you can have a patient lay underneath this and have the laser go above it and write in, in vivo. Okay, now in our case, our patients are cats or rabbits, all right? Um, you can't use this on humans, although we are building a human-specific system, right? At this point, um, we were working at 800 nanometers, and it was a four-photon process. If you frequency double to 400 nanometers, now it's a two-photon process, which means the process is much more efficient. So you have Galvo control going into a microscope objective, and then you have global position control. This is in a um, NA1 uh, microscope objective, although the beam is um, not filling the aperture. So it's about NA.7 for probably a lot of these measurement or a lot of these results. And if you do some scanning algorithms and so forth, you can imagine that if we want to build up a large area of refractive device, say seven millimeters by seven millimeters, which is starting to get to be what you need for the human vision, um, you know, you're limited based on your microscope objective. So in this case, we're limited to about um, one, one millimeter. And actually, we, had, we recently had to truncate it to about 750 microns because of edge effects at the edge of the field. But you can stitch together these lines, all right? And we can have a scanning pattern that looks something like this. And if we do things correctly and synchronize, we can change the, the intensity along this line and then blank the laser. I guess we're going this way. And then blank the laser when our velocity gets too low. So I said we had a, a velocity-dependent process. If our velocity goes to zero, we burn. Right? If you hold a piece of paper in front of a pulsed laser for trying to align it, it will light it on fire. You need to continuously move the paper. Right? It's the same thing for these hydrogels. Now, when we do this, we generate optically clear structures. Okay? You have to look at them at a very specific angle. So actually, in this case, I'm looking at this at an angle to see a sort of diffraction pattern. We've actually doped this with sodium fluorescein just so we can really see these lines here. And at this point, this is the, actually the first large area structure. This, I want to say, is about 10 millimeters in uh, 10, maybe 8 millimeters in diameter. This whole th button is 15 millimeters in diameter. Um, and uh, you, know, you can see we have these individual lines, and we're still working out some of our effects of our, our scanning process. All right. So this is how it works in hydrogels. And I'm going to come back to the hydrogels at the latter part of this talk. But now I'm going to switch gears and talk about iris in the cornea. Right? So one of the things you may be asking is, OK, you have this hydrogel and you have this cornea. And they're two entirely different material bases. How does this same process work for both of them? Right? The short answer is you can think of it as locally densifying the material for cornea. That's not, a, not the same mechanism for um, hydrogels. It actually changes it from a hydrophilic to a hydrophobic state, which pushes water out. In cornea, it's kind of the opposite. Cornea is, um, uh, is made up of collagen. So these are collagen fibrils. This is TEM, right? So this is scale bar 400 nanometers. This is 10 microns. This is a keratocyte nucleus. Here's our iris line. So this is us. Coming out of the board, this is we've written some lines, and then we cut our tissue, uh, and we're looking at on it on face. Okay, and if we zoom in here, you can see that we have this ordinary structure of our collagen fibrils, and your your collagen in your cornea is organized in these sort of um, interweaving layers, which is why these fibrils look different than these fibrils, which look different than these fibrils. But our line here just sort of breaks down that organized matrix. And we think that that, and I'll show over the next couple of slides, starts to push water out of that region. Okay? So we induce a localized densification of the corneal fibrils around um, an area of radically altered organization. We don't observe any cutting or incisions. Um, and cells are not generally cut when the laser goes through them. There, there are some instances where we will um, kill a cell, um, but we don't see wholesale ablation. Um, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. So this is an example of us comparing iris to LASIK. And we're using a femtobased LASIK, so not the case where we use a microkeratome and a razor, basically a razor blade to cut the flap, and PRK. Um, and we're looking at this in 
cat cornea. All right? So let me orient you for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, the corneal biology. This is the end epithelium. This is the top surface of your eye. And then this is going down into the eye. And it's the same for all of these. Now, PRK, I said the first thing they do is they debride the epithelium. So this blue regime here is healthy cells. In PRK, there's no healthy cells there because the first thing they do is re they remove those. All right? In the LASIK case, this is us cutting a flap and then putting the flap back. All right? So we actually cut a 10 millimeter flap and we only ablate a small part in the, in the center so that we can use the same eye for different experiments. All right, so we're looking at a regime here where there's been no uh, ablation underneath it. But because the energies are so high um, when you cut the flap, you get this so-called subablation zone. And we're not the only ones that have published on this. So if you look on this graph here, this is the distance from the, the epithelium. This is us doing cell counting. Everywhere where you see red is basically telling you that a cell is dying. All right, tunnel is, um, is a stain for DNA double strand, double strand breaks, okay? In our case, um, we autofluoresce here, and then we see some ablation, but it's generally localized to our region, okay? Now, when we look at when we, where we ablate, this is where things get interesting, okay? So once again, iris is here, LASIK is here, PRK is there. Because you scrape the epithelium back, all right, all of this stuff gets ablated and removed. When you have LASIK, you remove this um, material, all right, and when you fold it back, you know, the, the material's gone, right? You've, you've, you've removed that from your, the, the cornea. In our case, we locally tighten things, and we see some expression here of a marker called gamma H2AX. And there's some uh, discrepancy in the literature as to what gamma H2AX uh, is used to express. Some of them say it has to do with RNA. Others say it has to do with osmolarity. In our case, Oh, no, I'm missing the chart. That's not cool. All right. In our case, you don't see any, uh, or in the case of LASIK, you don't see any gamma H2AX. In our case, based on our cell counting, we only see expression of gamma H2AX above and below the LASIK, or above and below the iris zone. And what we think that means is the laser goes in there, it densifies the tissue, the tissue has water in there. That water gets expelled out, which causes an osmolarity change, which then triggers our gamma H2AX. All right? So we only see gamma H2AX actually above and below. And I, I know it's not quite clear on this, but when you take this over hundreds of slices of tissues, you see this beautiful sort of M shape where our ablation region and this region above and below. So that gives us a, a mechanism of action that we can look towards. Now, how does this work in vivo? Um, so this is a cat um, where we wrote in a live cat. This is immediately post iris. You can see these bubbles. This is a minus two diopter cylinder. Or, I'm sorry, a minus one diopter cylinder. Uh, this is one month post iris. You can't see it. And then 11 months post iris, you really, really can't see it. So immediately post iris, if you look at just the right orientation, you can see some scatter because there is some micro bubble formation. Across four eyes, um, we, were uh, we were trying to induce a minus 1.5 cylinders, so we induced slightly less than that. Um, so this is, for example, our, our second cat where we followed it out to 100 days, and it's relatively stable. For bio data, this is actually really pristine. Um, we published this in 2014 in IOBS. We have follow-up data that shows that the refraction is stable out to 18 months in live cats before we had to sacrifice the animals for an entirely different thing. Now, what happens to those cells after you perform this treatment, all right? So this is popcorn, one of our cats. This is the iris region. This is confocal. Uh, microscopy looking down through the cornea. So this is the epithelium. This is the endothelium. This is where we wrote. And this is us looking at tunnel after we extracted the eyes um, 
after sacrificing the animal, and you can see that it's completely devoid of cells. And this is 16 months post iris, so this is well beyond any regime where you would have um, cellular regeneration. It would typically be within the first six weeks to three months type of regime. So there's no more cells that are getting back in here. So we think that this is an indication that what we did to the cornea is permanent. Now, these are relatively small patterns, and we had some issues here where we were trying to write a minus one and a half diopter cylinder, and we only got minus one. And one of the reasons is this is a relatively small pattern. Our Shack-Hartman wavefront sensor is designed to take refractive changes over the whole cornea. So we're measuring over this sort of area, but we're only affecting this small region. And so our metrology is not tailored for the region that we're writing over. So what can we do? We can build a whole system and write large area patterns. So this is a lot of work done by Dan Brooks, um, who ju re just recently graduated. He built a large scale scanning system. And you can kind of see the bubble formation here. This is immediately post, or this is actually just after it was finished writing. So we still have the applination ring on the eye. Um, this is also cat cornea. And you can kind of see this Fresnel structure of a cylinder. The reason that we write cylinder in cats is because they have no native astigmatism. Crystal Huxlin, one of our collaborators who's done all of the in vivo work, um, she has trained cats to be wave frontable, so they will sit there and chew on food and focus on something long enough for us to use a camera and wave front them. You laugh, but that's how it works, all right? Um, and it's actually quite difficult, and I think she's the only group in the world that can do this, all right? So we have a model here where aside from the iris being different shape, the optics of a cat are very similar physiologically to humans. And so we believe that if we do this to cats, the, um, and, and we can translate that into humans, all right? And I'll give you data for that in a second, all right? So this is um, looking at, which cat is this? I don't have the cat name on here. All right. One of the things that we, we um, had with our first set of in vivo experiments, we showed that we could generate refractive change. We showed that it was stable, but we also had a large amount of defocus. I did not show that. We had a large amount of defocus. And one of the reasons why we thought we had defocus was because of Zernike decomposition. We had this large area that we're measuring over. We have a square structure, but we're fitting the Zernikes, which are, 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 are um, circular. And we're using a relatively small area that we have to find in the cornea, OK? So if we write a larger structure here, we get much better metrology on that. And when we do that, what we find is that when we're trying to write a minus 0 0.8 di uh, diopter cylinder, that's this dotted line here, and this is days post writing. So there's a few days, because the cat has to be knocked out for this. Um, there's a few days of recovery. And then they start going back to work, and we wave front them. Um, we can see that we have um, a relatively stable cylinder in the eye. And we also have relatively stable defocus in the eye, too. All right? So that defocus that we were seeing, we largely think that's due to some metrology errors, not necessarily due to our writing process. Um, this is another cat. This is MacArthur. Um, at the time of doing this, um, this was only about 15 days post-op. So this we were trying to do minus one and a half diopter cylinder. Here you can see the pattern in the eye. And one of the things that we're looking at is what are the higher order aberrations that we have? And so you can see from J6 all the way out through 20, these are very, very, very low. Okay. So when we write this pattern, we're writing basically a cylindrical pattern, and we're not really inducing any higher order aberrations in the eye, which is good. Um, now, I said that we're writing in cats. The reason we do this in cats is because getting human tissue is very difficult. Um, and generally, it's not in the most pristine shape. Okay? The, the, the corneas tend to be yellowed. Um, for our cats, they're sacrificed on one day, and we get the eyes the next day. In this case, this is us comparing human cornea. So we're using donor-grade human cornea tissue. Um, but in some cases, we're getting it six days post-mortem. And so the tissue has really started to degrade there. All right? Now, these are our, what we call our um, uh, benchmarking experiments here. So here we write 
lines of refractive index change at a constant velocity, so this is 10 millimeters per second at a constant power. And then what we do is we shine a laser through here and we measure the relative diffraction orders that you get in a scattering measurement. And if you do this in cat cornea and you do this in human cornea, you get to within the noise a nominally similar refractive index change. So in addition to we already knowing that the physio physiological makeup of the, of the cornea is similar for cats and humans, our process does effectively the same thing. Right? So the cat data, this was from Lee and Zhu and IOVS in 2011, and then we recently published this last year in bi the journal Biomedical Optics. All right. So that's kind of the landscape of where we were at when I came to the University of Arizona. Okay? So where do we go from here? All right. One of the things that I'm going to focus on here is specifically contact lens manufacturing. So this is a contact lens. This is one of our iris structures in here. It is a Fresnel lens. All right. My, I just want to give you a size scale of what we're doing and, and how this works. Right? So why contact lenses? They're commercially available. They're near ubiquitous. Right? Everybody in this room, for the most part, can go get contact lenses. There's not really an issue with them unless you don't like touching your eye. But that's not a fundamental, chain, or fundamental issue. Um, but it turns out that there are really practical problems with contact lenses. So for example, a typical contact lens line has greater than 22,000 molds to cover 95% of the refractive corrections that the human population needs. Right? It actually turns out that this is an inventory problem. And the reason is you have 0.2 diopter spherical increments. You have 0.2 diopter astigmatic increments. And then you have to worry about your astigmatic angle at every 10 degrees. Right? And this starts to be a very large cube of molds that you need to fit because every single one of these must be tailored to its astigmatic increment, its astigmatic angle, and its spherical increment. And the reason is how these sit on the eye um, is very particular. All right? And so depending on the shape of the refractive zone, you need different types of features on here. So in this case, this is every time you blink your eye, this is forcing this bottom surface down. In this case here, they put the features on the side of the contact lens. And so every time you blink, this thing sort of reseats itself to stay at the right astigmatic angle. And if you have astigmatism, then every single one of these molds has to be at a different angle. You can't just take your base mold and rotate it slightly. It doesn't work because then these features are rotated off of the axis for where your eye blinks. All right? So uh, this is just me showing in, in, uh, with a cell phone camera. This is our hydrogel. This is Contamac 58. Um, this is a, uh, what we call a button. It's a 15 millimeter diameter, 500 micron thick piece of hydrogel. Um, it is a commercial, it, it, it's sold under various other names for commercial contact lenses. So it's an FDA approved material. Um, this is an optical table. And this is me writing a minus one diopter iris lens over this area. And you can't see it. But if you look closely, the size of this hole is slightly different than that. Right? And so you can generate you know, relatively low power devices here. This is just a, a, a kind of a cartoon example. You know, we wrote a, a, a lens and we said, hey, does it have power? I don't know. Why don't we look at something and take a look? Right? We can do it a little bit more. Um, we can do more sophisticated measurements if you build up the apparatus to do so. All right? So Gustavo spent a lot of time building an MTF bench. So this is us looking at an Air Force bar chart to give you an idea of the MTF bench. Um, this is 40 line pairs per degree. Um, most optical devices are typically tested out to 30 line pairs per degree. Um, this is us looking through a plus 1.63 diopter refractive device. You can clearly see 40 line pairs per degree and even higher um, spatial frequencies than that. The human visual limit is about 60 line pairs per degree based on the rods and cones. All right, and we show that we have near um, diffraction limited performance with our um, contact lenses. All right. 
The Strel ratio in this case is about 71%. 80 is typically considered diffraction limited. And here, you can see this is the human visual limit. This is our baseline MTF. This is our actual measured MTF here. So when we don't have a lens in here, um, these labels are flipped. When we don't have a lens in here, we can see our Air Force bar chart. And then when we stick our lens in here, remember this is zero, not minus one and a half, our defocus changes. Right? So if we move our system, we can refocus back at minus one and a half diopter. So this is us writing minus one and a half diopter lens. We wrote this at 500 millimeters a second and 0.2 micron line spacing. And then we measured this on an adaptive optics simulator to get these um, parameters here. So this is us measuring it on the MTF bench and just looking at Air Force bar charts. This is us generating a test plate where we artificially relay this optical device into someone's eye with a known adaptive optics vision simulator. And when we use a phantom, basically a plate that has no refractive change, just a Contamac piece, all right, and when we have a plate in there, our contrast sensitivity is near identical, all right, it's buried in the noise, and we can clearly see that we have a defocus shift and a slight degradation, but not too bad of a degradation, all right? Now, log mar is not really a well-known um, visual acuity metric for the um, um, general population, right? We tend to think of 2020 or 2030. Each one of these is like a 2020, 2030, 2040, and so forth, all right? And down here is right around 2010, so the next line up is 2020. So we're getting better than 2020 visual performance doing this. Now, one of the things that I said earlier is that we want to do this for presbyopia, all right? The reason we want to do this for presbyopia is we can do some really interesting things with our process because we can write any arbitrary refractive device and we're not beholden to a specific mold that has to be tailored to an individual patient or an individual prescription. We can have a contact lens that's molded to fit the eye, and then we can go in there and write any sort of arbitrary correction that we want in that. So we don't have to have all these molds. We can have five or ten base molds. We don't have to have thirty thousand of them. Right? The problem with presbyopia is if you have some far object, all right, so something that's way out here, and it goes through your vision, visual system and focuses on your retina. Okay, this is just a cartoon, right? I'm ignoring all the refraction at the various interfaces, but I think you get the idea. We're focusing down on the retina. If you're focusing down on the retina, for a near object, when you get older, your lens can't accommodate anymore, and so you have some residual defocus there on your retina. So what happens is in everyday sort of use, you're constantly training back and forth between something that's far, and then you might look at your cell phone, and then you've got to move your hand far away. You might have seen people do this, right, if they don't have reading glasses. I see a couple of faculty in the room sort of nodding. And, and, all right? and what happens is your far object can focus, and your near object cannot. What we really want to do is put a multifocal contact lens here that causes you to focus on your retina at both wavelengths. And the way that we do this is with a Fresnel lens where we add just a little bit of power. It's not a full wrap at one wave. It's a wrap at, say, 0.2 waves of, of, of change. And we can add a little bit of, not accommodation, but we can add a little bit of near focusing power. So this is part of a contact lens study that we've been doing at the University of Rochester and at, at Clario's offices. Um, this is an IRB approved study. We've had patients come in. They are double blind so that the person who's testing them does not know which contact lens they are using. So the person performing the test is blind to the patient or to, or to the contact lens. And the patient doesn't know which contact lens they're testing. They're just given contact lenses to try on, and we run them through a battery of optical tests. All right? So this is the through focus visual acuity. This is a control here. So this is an example of what, what a, a measurement we would have for a number of different patients. You know, here's our standard deviations and so forth. And good is lower on this chart. All right? 
And what we want to do is we want to add a little bit of nearsighted power to our system. All right? And so when we take our, our multifocal, what we call the Clario Freedom, and this is an example of you know, our Fresnel structure that we write, all right, we get a little bit of um, reduced far vision, but we get a rather large increase in near vision. So now it's easier for someone to look at something that's close and something that's far. We have, um, oh, and if you just look at the differences between the two of these, um, and this has been converted into lines of acuity, right? So how many of you have been to the eye doctor and they say, read the top line, read the next line, right? You have the big E and then you have two letters and three and so forth, right? So we're getting over two lines of improvement at the near area and you're getting about half a line degradation at the far, which is actually not too bad because you generally don't need that good of sight from, from afar um, to focus on really fine featured things, right? Whereas when you're reading something, you know, a smartphone or a book or something like that, you generally want to have a lot better performance, right? Um, I'm not allowed to show it, but we have um, comparison data from the same patients who have measured um, on all commercially available multifocal contact lenses, and I can say that our results are, are hands down the best of all of them. Most of them have very little benefit, if any, that we can measure in the patients. Um, so this is what we want to focus on here. So what's the research direction? All right. Well, to write contact lenses, let me go all the way back to this. To write this contact lens, to give you a size scale, this is 14.2 um, millimeters at the base here, and this is five millimeters up there, and these are our little Fresnel wraps, all right? Because of the way that we're writing this, Because of the way that we're writing this, our writing speed is limited to five millimeters per second. And it's partly because we have this three axis stage where we're moving a lot of mass around. We have a relay that's not set for, um, uh, for relaying on two different axes because that's uh, a much more difficult um, optical design. All right? And so it takes us about two hours per lens, if not three hours between setup, alignment, and everything else to write one contact lens. And that contact lens can only be used on one patient. So if you're trying to do you know, studies where you're measuring off 10, 15, 20 patients and you want to test them on a number of contact lenses, we're writing basically 24-7 with our writing systems to be able to do that to do some of these IRB studies. And the diameter is, for presbyopia, it's fine. But when someone gets a presbyopic correction, they're also going to need just a general correction, right? So they're going to have whatever their general refractive correction for their eye they're going to need, plus a presbyopic correction on top of it. So we can't write over this five millimeter area. We have to get over eight and a half or nine millimeters or so, and that's going to cover enough of the cornea, right? So we're limited based on our geometry. So one of the things that I want to focus on here is um, we can use the geometry of the contact lens to our advantage, right? So right now we're using a commercial off-the-shelf microscope objective. It has a flat focal plane. It's designed for water immersion NA1. We don't actually need NA1. We need about NA.3, right? And one of the reasons why there's so many lenses in your microscope objective is it needs to correct pet's fall, right? In our case, if we go back to our lens, or Let's go back to our lens. If we go back to our lens and we try to flatten this surface, that's one way that we can do it. But then we worry about stress that we induce on the contact lens, yada, yada, yada. You don't want to damage it or tear it. These things are, are thin and fragile. But if you write through the back surface this way, you actually gain an advantage from pet's fall because a microscope objective nominally wants to curve that direction, so you don't have to correct for pet's fall. So you can have a relatively high NA system with a rather simple optical design over a large field. So this was from uh, Dan Brooks's PhD thesis. This is a six element, um, it's actually eight when you factor in the doublets, but it's a eight, nine elements. 
um, where the contact lens sits on the back surface here, and we're having a relay over here and then a, a, another um, galvo here to be able to scan over a large field, okay? So we're in the process of finalizing the design on this thing, and then we want to have it made, build it, test it, and set it up in the lab. We're setting up a high-speed scanning system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I showed some data where we were writing at 500 millimeters per second earlier, all right? We know from our existing system, our speed limit that we can write at is 800 millimeters a second, and that has to do with our relay and the size of our microscope objective field. We haven't been able to do anything faster than that, okay? If we do a simple scale up to a nine millimeter diameter, this 800 millimeters per second translates to about 130 seconds per lens. All right, so it's considerably better than two hours, but it's still not fast enough, all right? For, to, for this to be commercially viable, you need to go up at least 5x, if not 10x, all right? And the fundamental question that we want to uh, address here is, can iris work at 5 meters per second, 8 meters per second, 10 meters per second, all right? It's a writing regime that we haven't, worked with before, right? You're getting to the point now where the individual pulses, you may only have two or three individual pulses because the spot is moving so fast. The uh, accuracy that we have to write with here is about half a micron. And so how do you write at half a micron accuracy when you're moving at eight meters per second, right? There's a whole precision engineering side of this. We're dealing with high powered lasers where we have to worry about our optics heating up and distorting things like spherical aberration or coma as a function of optical power that we apply to the system, all right? But if we do that and get a 10x speed improvement, we can get down to about 13 seconds per lens, all right? And then this is from, you know, our funders, they say that this is the commercially viable breakpoint, if we can get to that, all right? Now, this is um, not done in a vacuum. A lot of the work, especially everything up to the cornea point and all the cornea stuff going forward um, has happened at the University of Rochester. Um, everybody who's underlined here has contributed directly to um, things that I showed in this presentation. So Wayne, Crystal, and Paul, they're the three other faculty members um, on this project. Dan Brooks was a PhD student of mine who just graduated recently. Marge is our cat whisperer. She does all of the um, cat measurements. Um, uh, Sarah is a current PhD student of Wayne's. Gustavo is a current PhD student of Wayne's. Um, Dan Savage uh, is an MD PhD student. Um, he finished his PhD recently. He's finishing med school, I don't know, this year or the next. And Caitlin is one of my last holdover students at the U of R. Um, at Clario, um, on the research side of things, I work primarily with Dr. Len Zelezniak and Sam Butler, um, and then Mike and Anna are responsible for setting some of the clinical and scientific objectives that match with this sort of business model. And we have funders, obviously Clario has given us a lot of money. We have money coming from um, CEIS, uh, it's a NYSTAR foundation, um, the School of Medicine and Dentistry, and their SAC incubator program at Rochester. Um, we have some NSF STTR. This is the phase one. We were just recently awarded a phase two and a phase two B. Um, and the research to prevent blindness has given some funding to this. And with that, I will take any questions that you may have.